Ladies and gents, this is the moment you've waited for. Been searching in the dark, your sweat soaking through the floor. And buried in your bones, there's an ache that you can't ignore. Taking your breath, stealing your mind, and all that once was is left behind. Don't fight it, it's coming for you right now. It's only this moment, don't care what comes after. Your fever dream, can't you see it getting closer? Just surrender, cause you feel the feeling taking over. It's fire, it's freedom, it's flood and open. It's the preacher and the pulpit and you'll find devotion. It's something breaking at the brink of every wall. It's holding all that you know. So tell me, do you wanna go? It's covered in all the colored lights. Where the runaways are running at night. Impossible comes to taking over you. Welcome. I'm going to take this off now. That was awesome. We so often, so often, um, miss out on the greatest story. Sometimes I think we think, I left all my stuff over there. Okay, here we go. You're so awesome. Can we give them a hand? I feel like this should be a backstage situation. <laughs> Just don't. Okay, here we go. Sometimes we, we, we get kind of in this place where we feel like we're just waiting for like the end. We're just waiting for this life to kind of get over and know that we have eternity to look for. But I want to suggest to you over the next few weeks that the greatest story isn't just the death and resurrection of Christ. The greatest story is the implications of that death and resurrection of Christ. Let me put it in another way. Uh, if you would, turn to Mark. Mark chapter 1. I lost my breath, man. It's so tiring. <laughs> My clicker got lost. It's just a mess. Mark chapter 1. Uh, Mark is one of the shortest gospels in the, in the uh, Bible, or the, out of the four gospels, because Mark really deals with how do we know Jesus is the Son of God uh, and kind of speaking to the non-Jew. And so the Jewish person, they want to know stuff like genealogy. You know, who's... Who's Mary's dad's dad's dad, dad, dad? And Mark doesn't care. He's like, just see what Jesus did. Just see what Jesus said and see how he backed it up. And so you get this chapter one of Mark, and, and it just kind of flies by a bunch of things. A water baptism, 40 days in the wilderness, like in a sentence. And then something is said that defines the rest of the ministry of Jesus. And here's what, here's what uh, Mark defines it as. And, Jesus, and John was put into prison. Jesus was sent into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And what is this good news? 
Here's what it is. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe. So the good news that Jesus declares is that the time has come. The kingdom of God is present. It's here. It's available to you and to me today. And so life should change. Prepare, repent, get get into the kingdom of God. What is the good story? It's the good story that Jesus only enables you and me to make the cut, if you will. Is is the story, is the good news simply that, yes, I'm saved as if I live this one life and and, and I make the cut, and when it's all said and done, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a green light, I have great fire insurance, we call it. Is, is that the good news? Or is the good news much, much more than that? Is there something for today that's part of the good news? I, I like what Dallas Willard says, and here's what he says. If I had to choose, I would rather have a car that runs than good insurance and one that doesn't. Can I not have both? That's good. In other words, he's saying as believers, hey, listen, I, if I had a choice, I, I would want to live my life the way that God designed it for me instead of just waiting until the end. But he would go on to say that can't we have both? Can't we live the life that God has described and declared and made available to you and to me and have great insurance in the end? And I would say yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The good news is more than Jesus dying on a cross. I I even thought about this this passage for a moment. Think about Jesus spreading the good news, or if I said to somebody, hey, let me tell you about the good news of Jesus, he's here. Do you think in any point that good news said something like, hey, let me tell you about this Jesus. He's going to go die on a cross and save me from my sin and forgive me, and I'm going to have eternal life. Prior to the death and resurrection of Christ, did anybody know that that was part of the good news? No. I mean, they were surprised, right? All the disciples took off running when Jesus gets betrayed and dies on a cross. They didn't get it. And so they understood that good news has something to do with a change in this life. Something to do with the kingdom of God that was available in the Old Testament was now available to you and to me and to everybody. That there was something different that was about to happen. And we would say that, yes, we know now that it was because of the death and the resurrection of Christ that we were afforded the life that we live. But the good news is, and the great story is greater than just fire insurance or death insurance. It's more than Jesus dying on a cross. I even thought this, you know, I I have preached this uh, for years and and, and I think I'm wrong. You ever been wrong before? I have said for a long time that, you know, living the Christian life is just hard. It's just hard. And think about this for a moment. Living the Christian life should be easy. And this is why. Because God made you. God created you. God formed you first and foremost to love and honor him. So there is a natural God-given shape within us that cries out to God. There's something within us that cries out. Our spirit person saying, man, I just need to worship God. I just need to serve him and honor him. That, that's the easy part. That should be the easy part. Are you following me at all? I want to suggest to you that the difficult part, honestly, is living opposed to what your spirit man is trying to tell you to do. Somebody help me. Let me give you another example, if you're not following. Another verse that we we often have taken out of context. In Matthew 11, 28, Jesus says this. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And I don't know how many times I have talked to someone or spoke to someone that's not a believer and say, hey, listen, man, just come to Jesus. He wants to give you rest and he wants to give you hope for your future. And those are all true. But, but do you know that this verse is speaking to the religious people? How many know that? 
That, that, that when Jesus is talking, he's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Christians of the day, those that attend church, those that give. He's saying to them, hey, listen, just relax. Come to me. In other words, he's saying that you, you're so trying to please men, please people. You're so trying to fit into a standard and into an idea and trying to make yourself worth something that, that you can't be. But if you would come to me and take my yoke on you, you would find that it's what? It's easy. That it's restful. And if you don't know what a yoke is, a yoke is they would take two oxen and there's this big piece of wood they put over the two of them and they would help them kind of work together as they plowed a field. And Jesus is saying to you and to me, hey, listen, partner with me. Partner with me. Walk with me. Do life with me. And if you do that, you will find your life very peaceful, restful, and rewarding. That's the easy part, yes? That's the great story that what God, through Christ, came to give. He's talking to religious people. He's saying, hey, listen, you wear yourself out by trying to do as Angie shared, and do, and do. You wear yourself up by trying to impress and be somebody you're not. I invite you to simply be my child, simply be my disciple. What you strive for is available only in me. What you strive for is available only in my presence. Learn from me. Enter my rest. Let me guide you. That's the good news. That's the hope of this life today. It's a story of availability of the kingdom today. The great story that God has brought his kingdom here and among us today. That although we live in this world, in this system, there's another world, there's another system at work. And God invites you and to me to enter that system, that kingdom, if you will. And in that kingdom, find purpose and meaning and value for where you are. Listen, we get upset and we get heavy burden because we find ourselves leaving the kingdom of God and going back to our worldly kingdom and saying, okay, to fit in, I have to be popular. Or I have to be, you know, I have to finish this work, or I have to do this task, or I have to make this much money. And God is saying, just let it go, come into my rest, live with me, and I'll make everything else happen. That, that's the kingdom of God. That's the good news. That's the story. And so today I want to hit just one part of, of this of this story. And let me start it this way. <laughs> have you ever felt like a character? in Rudolph's uh, Island of Misfit Toys. Anybody? Have you ever felt like you just don't fit in? Yeah. Like everybody else seems to fit in, but you're like the oddball. I, I feel like that all the time. And I try. I mean, I try to fit in, I mean. <laughs> Whatever. But I, I, mean, I think sometimes we feel like we're the outsiders, that we, we're misunderstood. We, we try to do what's right, and no one really gets it. We don't fit in. Uh, can I say you're not the only one? How many know that, right? I, <laughs> we look at some people and we think, man, they, they have it together. Like, they're the popular people or they have the money or the prestige. And we think that somehow they've arrived in, in their mind or in their heart there's this peace. Uh, but if you talk to, I, I challenge you, talk to anybody and say, hey, do you feel like you're an outcast, a misfit? I bet you everyone says absolutely Yes. But long before the greatest show came, God featured people that were oddballs and black sheep, that were rebels and sinners, uh, just like me and just like you. Outcasts, people that didn't measure up. I would call us Messiah's misfits. We're Messiah's misfits. In this world, in this kingdom, you will find that you are chosen or esteemed and celebrated by what you do and what you have instead of who you are. In this world, you're celebrated if you have good looks, if you have good grades, if you have more stuff or better stuff than the person 
near you. If you have athletic ability, if you've performed some expectation of what a job description has, and all of those you're esteemed and highly valued and favored. In those areas that have said you've arrived, and they're not bad, but none of those matter most in the kingdom of God. Remember the story when 1 Samuel chapter 16. Samuel is a prophet. He's God's chosen man. He, he, he's been seeking God. He loves God. I mean, right, we, you have to get this backdrop. Samuel is totally in line with God. Are you with me? So he, Samuel is the prophet. He's God's man, and he's been talking to God. So God says to Samuel, um, hey, I want you to go find another king because I'm not happy with Saul. And so God says to Samuel, I want you to go to uh, Jesse's house. Samuel uh, gets there. He, he calls Jesse's family to sacrifice with him. And then something happens that I, that, that I find very, I, I don't know. I understand it. So you know the story. All these boys come in, and the, the first of the oldest son of Jesse comes in. And, and Samuel looks at him and says, this is the guy. Right? This is the story? This, this is the guy. He's a warrior. He's tall, dark, and handsome. He's a fighter. He's a leader. This is God's man. And, and the crazy part for me still is that, like, this is Samuel. This is God's man, God's prophet. And he misses he misses on who God is calling. Does that make sense? And for me, that's like, if, if Samuel can miss God, then I know that I can miss God too. And so Samuel says, this has got to be the guy. This has got to be it. And, and, the, and the guy comes by, comes by and God says, no, this, this, isn't, this isn't the one. And, and I think Samuel's surprised, right? Like, what? Okay, it must be somebody better. A better fighter, a better warrior. Second son comes in, and the same thing happens. And it happens like seven times. And so finally, I think at a moment of, of frustration, Samuel says, hey, you know, maybe I'm just missing it completely. Do you have another son? Is there somebody else I'm missing, Jesse? What's going on? And, and I think Jesse's almost, almost like this, I have one left, but. <laughs> you ever done that before? Right? Not about your own kids. I'm just saying about the other people's kids. And you're like, well, I, you know, I, ha- I, I got, I, yeah, I, I got, I have one left, but you don't want them, right? Come on. Not this one. As a matter of fact, he's not out here fighting. He's not even to sacrifice. He's, he's out tending some sheep. He's not a warrior. He's not a fighter. It's not the guy. And I think Samuel, I'm going, I know I'm going into some liberty here, but Samuel, I think he's like, you know, maybe I missed God on this. Maybe I totally missed it. Like, God, you sure it's not the oldest? I think that's the guy. And so you go through, and all of a sudden, um, Jesse says, all right, bring, bring David. Right? Bring him in. And ladies, you appreciate this. I don't know why Scripture says something sometimes, but this is what it says. It says, and David had... David had nice eyes. It was an attractive man. Like, why do we need to know that? I'm just saying, for all of us guys that don't have nice eyes, I feel like I'm eliminated, you know? And so he comes in, nothing great, and God's like, yep, this is the guy. This is the guy. And we, we know this passage. We know why it is because we've, we've, we've quoted this so many times, but we... <laughs> But we fail to really grasp all of it. Sometimes you can become so familiar with the story that you miss the meaning. And so he says, hey, the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. Man looks at outward beauty or intelligence, things together. Man looks at popularity or, right? Somebody help me here. Don't, do we not look at people based upon certain criteria that's defined in our culture as this is it? And then we say, yep, you're the leader, you're not. You're following, you're like, you go. <laughs> Don't we do that? 
And I want to suggest to you that in the kingdom of God, in the story of God, in God's kingdom, he says, listen, I don't despise gifts and beauty and, hey, David had nice eyes. I don't despise all that. But what I want is someone whose heart is after me. That's what I desire. Everything else I can fill in the blanks. But if you give me somebody, just give me somebody whose heart says, God, I love you. I don't care what people think, do or say. I don't care if I don't fit in. I'm a misfit for Jesus. I'm your, I'm your, your misfit. And, and with that, that and God yoked together, you can do great things. Amen. Amen. This is the story throughout Scripture. And we've shared this many times. Moses Moses ran from justice, but God used him. Jonah ran from God, but God used him. Rahab ran a brothel. Sarah ran out of hope. Lot ran with the wrong crowd. God uses them all. Even go to the the next passage in in Mark chapter 1, if you have it open. By the way, if you have the Bible app, this is all under the Bible app. Uh, Patrick, where's Patrick at? I copied you, dude. So Bible app, it's under events if you want. But don't do it now. I'll do now, but like the whole message thing is there. So we go. So in, in Mark chapter 1, after we hear this deal about Jesus proclaiming the good news and so forth, he chooses his disciples. <laughs> this always blows me away. And when he chooses disciples, most of them are ordinary fishermen. Nothing against fishermen. I'm just saying they stink. Right? Or ladies, fish or ladies, I'm all with whatever. But I'm just saying that, I mean, this is what they did. Probably no real education, nothing great. They just fished. I don't know how you do it all day, nets, whatever they do, but that's, that's what they did. And most of the disciples were simple, ordinary misfits. I mean, yeah, yes, there was Matthew who was a tax collector and a couple of other ones. But for the most part, I mean, Jesus wasn't looking for how many Instagram followers you had. Right? Can you imagine that? If, if that's what Jesus' criteria was, Instagram is cool today. Unless you have 100 followers, you're not in my kingdom. Like, how many, right? Or how many likes you get? How many Snapchat posts you have? He doesn't look at your talent or your ability. He doesn't look at how, I mean, I'm just saying there's something different about how God looks at people than you and me. And it's a difference between this kingdom and his kingdom. The whole church was birthed out of ordinary misfits. Nothing special, nothing popular. It's ordinary, everyday people that simply love God and wanted to serve Him. If you're a misfit today, you have hope. Amen. If you feel like you don't fit in, you might be God's next David. I love the fact that God even uses quitters. Peter, ordinary misfit. Peter betrays Christ how many times? At least three, at a minimum. Paul rebukes Peter later on. So his lifestyle, I think, was kind of had a big mouth. Well, he even called him Satan. Let's just be honest. It's even worse than we think it is. And when Peter betrays him, he says he doesn't know him. What does Peter do? He takes off, and he goes back to fishing. Three times Jesus has to say to him, listen, Peter, if you love me, then feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Have you ever felt like quitting? Anybody else? Can I just be transparent? I, I... It's probably not a week that goes by that I don't feel like quitting. I feel like I am the least talented pastor out of all the friends that I know, right? I mean, I feel like 
I look, I got a buddy, I'm like, man, this church is exploding, people are getting saved, they're like on 18 services all within an hour, right? Like for a pastor, that's a big deal. He was on the outreach magazine of the world's top growing churches. People, man, I'm like, he's ripping up Alaska. The whole state of Alaska saved at least 10 times. And, I, and I'm, I'm like, man, I just stink. I, I don't measure up. I mumble, I talk quick. I, I, somebody help me out here. And, and I just feel like, I feel like there's so many people that could do better. You know, right? No. Don't you feel that? No, 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 no. But don't you feel that way in your life? In your life, don't you feel like, like some things you just don't measure up on? But I just want to suggest to you that's okay. I think that's what misfits do. I think misfits feel like we don't measure up. They were the outcast. And in the moment, I think if we get our hearts centered back to the kingdom of God, if we get our hearts centered with God, I think he says, all right, you're in the position I want you now because you're not depending on your ability, your talent, your looks, your desires, your gift set. Dude, without me, you're nothing. And then God's like, all right, I'll use you. We're misfits. And that's okay. I, you know, even, even Paul says this to the Corinthians. He says, listen, did you know that we're Messiah's misfits? <laughs> that's what Paul says. Paul, Apostle Paul. You might be sure of yourselves, but we live in the midst of frailties and uncertainties. To the Corinthians, you, you think uh, you might be well thought of by others, you're most, uh, but we're mostly kicked around. Much of the time, we don't have enough to eat. I mean, listen to this story. We wear patched and threadbare clothes, not because they're cool and hip, right? That's the cool thing. If your pants are all ripped, you're cool. I'm not cool. We don't wear patched or ripped or threadbare in clothes. We get doors slammed in our face, and we pick up odd jobs anywhere we can uh, elk. I don't know what that means. We can uh, make a living. It's make, not eek. Make a living. I want to listen to this. When they call us names, we say, God bless you. How many respond like that? You're a loser. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I could do so much better than you. God bless you. God bless you. When they spread rumors about us, we do what? We put in a good name for them. Wow. Maybe being a misfit isn't so bad. We're treated like garbage, potato peelings from the culture's kitchen. And you know what? It's not getting any better. Church, we, we are misfits. If you're a believer, if you're a follower of Christ, you will not fit in. You won't. And I want to suggest to you, the more you try to fit in, the less you become like Christ. Is that fair? The more you try to make all the connections line up, the less you become like Christ. But the more you become like Christ, the more you focus on, God, I want to honor you and serve you and live for you and love you and have a relationship with you. I think after that, nothing else even matters anymore. It doesn't matter. You're not on Facebook comparing how many friends you have or who liked what. You're not on Instagram comparing. It doesn't even matter. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. I am gentle and I'm humble at heart. I want to end with one, one thought. Actually, two. I've read this passage numerous, numerous times. I never saw this, never dawned on me until the last couple of weeks. Matthew 1, 9, 11. Jesus is coming out of the water, getting water baptized. He sees heaven being uh, torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. A voice from heaven declares, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And I've heard this, I mean, I've read it. It's, yeah, that's cool. But think for a moment. Do you realize that God, God says, I love my son before he did a single thing? 
Before Jesus ever healed a sick person, before Jesus ever raised someone from the dead, before Jesus ever said your sins are forgiven, before Jesus ever multiplied food, before Jesus did anything, gee, God said, I am pleased with you. So it wasn't about what Jesus did, but it was about who Jesus was. And Jesus was someone that said, I want to please my Father. Amen. Let's listen to this for a moment. God is looking for you and to me to love him, to fellowship with him. And in that, he says, my child, I am pleased with you. And in that, everything else will follow. Beautiful rose, eh? Something about a painting. No one gets to tell the painter what to paint. The painter gets to paint his portrait or his masterpiece, however he or she desires. Desires it. It's his or her painting. No one gets to come in and say, I don't like that painting. I don't like how you did that. It's not their business. It's only the painter's business. Are you following? The Bible says that you are God's masterpiece. You are God's painting. You are God's molding. No one gets to come in and tell you what you should look like or what you should do or how you should respond. You are God's. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. You're his painting. You're his design. <laughs> You're his masterpiece. Don't let anyone tell you different. Don't let anyone tell you different. If somebody wants this, you can take it after the service. It's wet, so be careful. Father, I pray. pray that you would remind us about the greatest story. <laughs> the kingdom of God is available to you, me and for us today, that you are here with us today. It isn't just about fire insurance for eternity, but today, today we get to spend time with you. Today we get to live in your presence. Today we get to live in your rules and your ideas. Yes, we're part of this world, but today we get to come in and step into your world, into your kingdom. Help that to be our focus. So I pray that you, God, would help us to I don't know, stop trying to do, stop trying, help us to stop doing trying to find our approval in what we do. Help us to stop looking at other people's opinion of us or other people's thoughts, hoping that we find value. Help us to find our value in you. Help us to strive to please and honor and to love and commune with you. God, help us to find relationship every day by loving and serving and honoring you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you haven't given your life to Christ, I just want to give you an opportunity. There's something about a public confession that, that this does something in our heart. And if you're here today and you're not living for Jesus, but today you want to change that. You want to accept his grace, his love, you want to enter his kingdom today. I want to invite you to pray with me. That's you. Just raise a hand real high and say, yes, I want to give my life to Jesus today. I'm not living for him, but I, I want to do that today. And if you're watching online, I would encourage you to join us as well. Saying yes. Father, I just pray for those that are giving their lives to you. Lord, um, it's not like a prayer that changes anything, but it's a, it's a calling on you of repentance saying would you forgive me would you help me to trust in you a prayer doesn't save us 
Only you do. And it's through relationships. So I pray for those, maybe they're watching online, that just today they say, yes, I give you my heart. I give you my life. I give you my future and my past. And I make you the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name.